May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Back in June, for Larry's Combo Pride Pentecost Sunday, I read scripture for him. There were two sets of readings, the gospel reading and then this verse alone. He said, read the story first because that's the lectionary for today. And then the Hebrews, I won't preach about it. It's just one of my favorites. And I know that it's a verse that brings comfort to so many. And it'd be easy to just say, don't mess with a good thing. But where's the fun in that? <laughs> so I need all y'all, faithful people, to bring your own experiences to what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to try to unpack all of this a little bit together. Now I want to start with what the updated new Revised Standard Version, released just this year, has to say about this verse. It adds footnotes on two of the words to give alternate interpretations of the Greek. So I'm going to read the traditional one first and then read the updated version replacing those two words so that you can perceive the difference. First, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, faith is the reality of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In the first one, the one I grew up with, I always felt like we were supposed to be comforted and reassured by our faith and then to express strong belief in the unknown. But in the second, the author of Hebrews is actually making a far bolder claim. Faith itself is what makes hope real. Faith itself reveals the truth about what we cannot see, namely all that is of God. Just sit with that for a moment. Faith itself makes hope real. The faith that we're talking about is not theology. It doesn't start, I believe that. The ra rather, the faith that we are talking about here is trust. It begins, I believe in. It's the phrase that's at the start of virtually every Christian creed. Literally, credo in Latin means, I believe. It's also at the top of our UCC statement of faith. Right? We believe in you. O oh God, eternal spirit. God of our Savior Jesus Christ and our God. And to your deeds we testify. And then only after this statement of trust do we begin the litany of God's faithfulness in the past. But that, that kind of trusting faith is really hard. Especially if you're going through hard times as so poignantly expressed by Bart in the song that Marco sang for us today. I know the sorrow, I know the hurt would all go away if you just say the word. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. We don't get to this kind of trust by thinking ourselves into it. Just like in our call to worship today, we're compelled, we're inclined towards movement of our hearts towards the holy which can never be started by us, but is the divine pull of God and the call towards the future. Theologian Frederick Beekner once defined this kind of faith like this. Faith is the word that describes the direction our feet start moving when we find that we are loved. Faith is stepping out into the unknown with nothing to guide us but a hand just beyond our grasp. 
In the second verse of the chapter of Hebrews, we're told that when the ancestors had that kind of faith, they received God's approval. This is a view classically aligned with Pauline theology, his theology of invitation for the Gentiles, more explicitly expressed in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where he said, For grace, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not works, lest anyone should boast. Not circumcision, not following a bunch of Jewish laws, just a gift of God that we know as grace. God is perpetually reaching out to us, and sometimes it breaks through all the noise, and we're able to believe in God, to trust in God enough to reach back out in return. By the time of Martin Luther, the central tenet of the Reformation was that believers are justified by faith alone, not works or any other kind of church-based exercise. Right? Faith alone, sola fide, is what every Reformed Protestant church, just like ours in the UCC, it's what we inherited. So 3,000 years of faith history from Abraham to now has led us to be sitting in this sanctuary. Faith alone, trust in God alone, is what receives approval or salvation or justification, if you like any of that old-timey biblical language. For me, for me, this kind of faith is just acceptance, finally, and then over and over again of God's embrace. And so in this chapter 11 of Hebrews, it gives us a long list of all the greatest and the good of the Hebrew ancestors who had that kind of faith. And we're only reading one of the vignettes today. The writer's trying to encourage newly converted Christians to keep the faith, just as their Jewish ancestors had done, and not turn back. The lectionary tells us to skip over Abel and Noah and just jump straight to Abraham, right? Who's the, basically the primogenitor of this kind of trusting faith, as far as Jewish people are concerned. The first to follow God into the wilderness, just as his descendants would do. The book of Hebrews is written to people within the Jewish diaspora. People cut off from a homeland held under oppression by Rome and feeling perpetually like strangers in other lands. The thread we hear is the reality that has, exist, is, that has, that has existed throughout Jewish history. Being exiled, being away from home. It's the same with migrants today crossing geographic borders or even people cast out by their families of origin for crossing social, cultural, or political ones. From another people in diaspora, we hear in the African-American New Testament commentary called True to Our Native Land from theologian Howard Thurman reflecting on the faith of his grandmother and her generation who had been in slavery. He said that the bitter contradictions of life are not final and the hope was built into the fabric of the struggle. This meant to them that the intensity of the tragic passage in which they were pilgrims could not be separated from the God in whom their ultimate trust was placed. This was their secret, and this they have transmitted to their children. Dr. James Massey goes on with the wider commentary there, saying all of the listed persons responded to life as pilgrims caught between past and future in a very demanding present. And their trust in God's concern for them gave them perspective and patience and persistence. All were persons of their time, but stirred by the forward look. They were seekers impelled by what was yet to be encouraged by what they anticipated. They all sensed that the meaning of their days would be clarified in time and vindicated by God. True faith is characterized by a forward look, he says, and an openness to the pull of the future that God has planned. 
So we see in the Hebrews passage that by faith, Abraham left home to live in tents in a foreign land on the promise from God of something more. And Sarah, again, got to read the footnotes for an alternate ancient translation, in the, even in the new R RSV, it says, by faith, like, like, like in the way the RSV translated it, like Sarah's just like a side note, but she's not. She, she, gets her like, she gets her own sentence if you read the alternate translation in the footnotes, right? And in the footnotes it says, by faith, Sarah herself, though barren, received power to conceive even when she was too old, because she considered him faithful who had promised, him being God. She had considered, she by faith was able to do these things because she considered God faithful who had promised these things to her. So Abraham and Sarah stepped into the unknown in trust of God's faithfulness to them. Now, the writer of Hebrews sort of anachronistically implies that Abraham and Sarah were yearning for a city whose, God was, whose, whose architect and builder was God, right? This is one of the reasons I agreed to preach today, because, like, how can I turn down preaching on a message that involves God being an architect and builder, right? But, but it was anachronistic, right? Like, like, Abraham and Sarah were not actually looking for a city, but, but this image of the city of God was a prevalent image in the writer's day, the writer of Hebrews' day, a new Jerusalem where God would reign on earth amongst the people based on the promises of all the prophets who came well after Abraham, right? And the author of Hebrews offers such beautiful empathy for those who are trying to keep the faith that we surely recognize our own loved ones in these sentences. All of these died in faith, without having received the promises. But from a distance, they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of the land they had left behind, they would have had the opportunity to return. We can always turn away, right? But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. And this is God's promise of creating home for everyone who feels exiled or estranged or wandering or wandering or seeking. God has been building it for centuries in covenant with faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races, as the UCC Statement of Faith would say. For our God is a God of immigrants, a God protecting those who face injustice, a God who is always there even when we resist, ignore, question, run away, or are angry. A God who is always just before us, beyond our reach, and yet a God who is always beside us so that we never have to feel alone. A God for the lost and lonely, the hurting and confused. And God knows, ain't that all of us at some point? This God is already right here, right now, even if we're at our lowest point, and it's hard to hang on to that faith. Even Bart wrote, it only takes a little faith to move a mountain. Well, good thing. A little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, oh, give me the strength to be able to say, it is well with my soul. Whenever we can keep even a sliver of faith, it's enough. The deepest and most raw, trusting kind of faith allows us to see the reality of our hopes is in God and to testify to the loving power of our God. And when we have the clarity, when we, when we desire a better, more heavenly home, when we are not ashamed to say that we feel like strangers on the earth, when we follow Jesus into becoming the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, when we confess like Bart, my hope is you alone, then the author of Hebrews reminds us 
that God is not ashamed to be called our God. So my friends, no matter where you are or where you are on life's journey, as we say here in the UCC, whenever, whatever sliver of faith you can wrestle up in these times, know that God is not ashamed to be called your God. Do not be ashamed or afraid to claim the depth of your faith in return. The one who put the cosmos in place has been waiting for it and waiting for you to come back home. Amen. <laughs>